Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Patty Harbold. I'm a director of uh, academic centers, Law Med being one of my centers. Um, I'm filling in for Max Melman, Professor Max Melman right now, and I just wanted to do a quick introduction of our uh, speaker. The title of the lecture is Accessible Health Tech, and our speaker is Jessica Roberts, who is a director of the Health Law and Policy Institute and the Leonard Childs Professor in Law at the University of Houston Law Center. Ms. Roberts specializes in genetics and the law and health law and disability law. And uh, we're just really happy to have her here today. So whenever um, you're ready to get started, we can begin. Thanks so much, Patty, for that introduction. Also, thanks to Professors Shrona Hoffman and Max Melman for organizing. I am delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, as Patty said, I'm the Leonard H. Childs Professor in Law at the University of Houston Law Center. And in case there are folks attending who have visual impairments, I am a white woman with long, dark hair, and I'm wearing a red dress and red lipstick. And I will also pause as I go through my slides to describe them to you. I was uh, looking at them earlier today and the suggested text was less than ideal. So I thought it would be easier to just offer you all an explanation. So today I would like to talk to you all about one of my current projects. It's called Accessible Health Tech. Um, and let me, now I'm having technical difficulties here. Here we go. Um, and so this is uh, this is my title slide here, and and it includes my name and the title of the talk, Accessible Health Tech. This project is actually uh, a paper that I'm working on with one of my former students, and there is a corresponding law review article. I warn everyone that. Law review articles tend to be long, but I am happy to share a draft with anyone who's interested. So I'll give you all my contact information at the end of the talk. So please feel free to reach out to me and I will happily provide you with a draft of the paper. So when we're talking about health technology, that can mean a lot of different things. So I think it's important for me to define exactly what I plan to talk to you all about today. So this is my second slide. It has the question, what is health tech? And a variety of different logos representing different kinds of health technologies. And I wanna be really clear that my focus this afternoon is on technologies that are offered through healthcare providers. Uh, and so this includes things like patient portals, um, which are usually accessible through websites and apps. So one of the logos here is for my chart. Maybe some of you all use my chart when you go to your doctors. Um, also mobile and web-based video conferencing for virtual appointments. Um, again, this is usually accessible through websites and, and apps. Um, DoxyMeet, Simple Practice, those are some examples of those. Again, maybe you all have used them in the course of the pandemic. And then finally, patient monitoring devices that are provided through physicians. So that means I'm not talking about the Apple Watch kind of wearables, but rather devices that your doctor would give you and have you take home so that you could keep track of your symptoms um, or log you know, issues related to your health remotely. Um, and so an example, would be my uh, my infant son has atrial tachycardia and his cardiologist sent us home with an event monitor, which was a little device that we had on his chest. And then it connected to a smartphone and it gave data to his doctors. So those are all the things I'm talking about. That seems like a lot, right? There's a wide range of different kinds of tech here. But again, it is all technology that is used by doctors and other healthcare providers in conjunction with healthcare provided to their patients, right? So that means that I am not talking this afternoon about direct to consumer health technologies that many of you have probably downloaded to your phones or smartwatches to self-monitor your health. I have in fact written about these consumer technologies as well. So if you have questions about how some of what I'm saying today applies to that set of technologies. I'm happy to try to answer those questions in 
very ambitious, broad project. It is relatively targeted. What we're really talking about, my co-author and I, is virtual access to healthcare. And I think, as we all know, virtual access to healthcare has become incredibly important. So during the pandemic, these technologies went from being a complement to traditional healthcare to being a substitute, right? These kinds of technologies allow doctors to maintain some kind of continuity of care while allowing individuals to limit their potential exposure to COVID-19. And so here I have a slide that features a headline from CNN.com back in March, and it reads that people with disabilities left behind by telemedicine and other pandemic innovations. So while this move to virtual healthcare eliminated certain kinds of barriers for patients with disabilities, so, so things like inaccessible facilities or inaccessible transportation services, it introduced new kinds of problems. So what might those problems be? Uh, and importantly, what makes health tech inaccessible depends on the type of disability that an individual has. So this slide is an infographic that represents different kinds of disabilities. It includes symbols of a person using a wheelchair, a person using a cane, a person with a mental impairment, um, and hands signing the word interpreter. And like the image implies, people with disabilities are incredibly diverse. So that means that they have diverse needs and preferences. And this reality also means that technology can fail them in a number of different kinds of ways. So what are some of the, the most common access barriers that one might encounter in the context of health technology? Well, video-based telehealth services can be challenging for people with communication barriers, and this is a wide range of um, different kinds of potential disabilities. So people who are deaf or hard of hearing, people who are blind or low vision, uh, people who have speech impairments, all of them might encounter difficulties using traditional video conferencing software. Patient portals can also be inaccessible. Um, they might not work with screen reading software or voice control software. So that might be challenging for, again, people with visual impairments or also people with mobility or dexterity impairments that might have difficulty um, using the, the screens. Um, so also too, remote patient monitoring technology can also be inaccessible. Uh, so these remote patient monitoring technologies usually have at least two components, a device, like I mentioned, the heart monitor my son used, um, as well as a software component. So that is the software interface that appears on the smartphone usually. Um, and our paper focuses primarily on the software issues just for simplicity's sake. Uh, it's targeted really at the developers of the technology, the software developers. Of course, the device designers also have to account for disability, but you know, we are being a bit ambitious. And so this is a, a, a limitation in scope. Uh, but you know, again, accessibility is important in that context as well, right? Um, and if you were wondering how many people this impacts. Uh, really, the inaccessibility of health tech could affect a substantial portion of Americans. So this slide features an image from the CDC, and it explains that 61 million adults in the United States have a disability, and that is approximately 26% of the population. So in other words, that's a little more than one in four Americans have a disability, and depending on that disability, could be affected by the inaccessibility of health technology. And unfortunately, individuals with disabilities were already encountering barriers to accessing healthcare even before this move to health tech. So this slide includes another infographic from the CDC, and it explains some barriers that people with disabilities have encountered, including in the context of analog, traditional healthcare. So one in three working age adults with disabilities do not have a usual healthcare provider. One in three have had um, an unmet health need because of cost in the past year. And one in four did not have a routine checkup in the past year. So it is not surprising then perhaps that people with disabilities experience health disparities compared to people without disabilities. 
So people with disabilities are more likely to rate their health as fair or poor as compared, they're four times more likely to rate their health as fair or poor as compared to people without disabilities. And when they do manage to access healthcare, if, if they can, in light of all of these different barriers, they actually tend to have worse health outcomes than people without disabilities. Um, you might remember that in the course of the pandemic, people with intellectual or developmental disabilities were actually six times as likely to die from COVID. And that is just one example. There are many others of um, people with disabilities having worse health outcomes comparatively. So when you layer inaccessible health tech on top of these existing inequalities, there's a real risk that people with disabilities could experience even more exclusion, segregation, and diminished healthcare access. And the inaccessibility of these technologies indicates that these developers that I was talking about that you know, we're really targeting with this paper, they're probably correctly assuming that the healthcare providers that purchase this technology are not prioritizing accessibility when they're shopping for health tech products and services. So this then raised the question, what do healthcare providers providers look for when they're deciding which of these many services they should incorporate into their practice. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the things that they seem to care a great deal about is HIPAA compliance. Um, and so uh, this slide here has a variety of language that I pulled off of websites of some of the health company, the health tech companies that I had in that preceding slide. Um, and all it's meant to show you all is that in addition to efficiency and profitability, which is also a marketing point, um, health tech developers are marketing HIPAA compliance. Um, and so just I'll, you know, I'll read some of these, you know, that say stay HIPAA compliant at all times, keep you and your clients safe with simple practice, which has been certified through high trust, a third party assessor that verifies the strictest level of HIPAA compliance. Um, and, you know, another one says your patients need to feel safe when they come to you. OMDs, HIPAA compliant texting platforms gives clinicians and patients the peace of mind that personal health information is secure. So you can focus on providing safe, high quality care. This is why OMD is trusted by over 40,000 healthcare professionals, right? So it's clear based on these materials that complying with HIPAA is something that the, the tech developers think will be important to healthcare providers. And the reason that we focus on HIPAA compliance is, as I will discuss momentarily, healthcare providers also, in addition to their obligations under HIPAA, have legal obligations to provide accessible, non-discriminatory healthcare. Yet they don't seem to be shopping that for that, or at least the developers don't seem to think that that's an important selling point. So developers clearly think that providers are looking for HIPAA compliance and that is valuable, but accessibility isn't similarly valuable. And the salience of HIPAA compliance is probably due at least in part to a, a law called the High Tech Act that gave providers both positive and negative incentives to adopt HIPAA compliant electronic medical records. Um, and depending on who you ask, this, uh, the High Tech Act was wildly successful in terms of getting the adoption of electronic medical records. Uh, hospitals use uh, of those records went from less than 10% to more than 80%. Some research says that this move was already happening, um, but it is true that now, you know, many of us have access to our uh, medical records electronically, right? So this gives us some evidence for why HIPAA compliance is considered valuable, um, which can then inform ways in which we might inspire developers and providers to likewise prioritize accessibility. Uh, so, you know, this raises the question then, you know, why aren't, uh, why aren't developers and providers uh, creating and adopting accessible health technology? So this slide says, why isn't health tech accessible? And then there are three bullets that represent the three different categories of reasons that, that we believe might be in play here. We believe there are legal, economic, and structural reasons why developers are not creating and providers are not adopting accessible health technologies. So I'll go through each of these reasons in turn. So this first slide is, 
the legal reasons. Um, and the slide has the letters ADA superimposed over zeros and ones. And so, so it's meant to represent the application of the ADA to digital technology. Uh, and so one straightforward reason why developers may not be designing health tech accessibly is simply that the law doesn't clearly compel them to do so. So the extent to which the ADA applies online is currently unsettled. Title III, which is the part of the ADA that covers public accommodations, so that's things like restaurants, theaters, and gyms, uh, is currently the subject of a three-way circuit split about whether or not public accommodations include things that operate outside of physical structures. So some circuits say that if you want to sue under Title III of the ADA, the good or service being provided has to be provided in a physical location. Other circuits say that, you know, denying an individual access to something that even if it isn't provided in a physical location, um, it could still deny full and equal enjoyment to people with disabilities. That is to say, it would still be actionable under the ADA. And then two circuits are somewhere in the middle and they say, well, there needs to be a connection between whatever you're offering as a good and service online, but it, it but you also have to connect it to, you know, a brick and mortar store. Um, and there's two circuits that require that connection and they actually use different tests, right? So there's there's a lot going on here and, and hopefully the Supreme Court will weigh in at some point to clarify, but um, it's worth noting that even if Title III clearly applied online, the way the statute is written, it's not entirely obvious that it would cover the developers who are designing health tech for providers. So the way this portion of the law discusses the entities it covers, is it has a non-exhaustive list and all of the examples in that list sell goods and services directly to the public, right? Uh, but the technology that I'm talking to you all about, the patients are the end users, but the purchasers are actually the providers. So maybe Title III might get at some of those direct to consumer technologies that I said I wasn't talking about, but it's unclear whether or not it would reach the developers of these provider targeted technologies. Um, and it's worth noting, and I'll say more about this, that Title III does explicitly cover private medical practices already. So to the extent that it would be applicable online, it might cover patient portals and health tech, but the entities that would be held liable would be the providers and not the developers. Um, and I think that that is a salient distinction once we get to talking about possible interventions to address these issues. So here is my next slide, um, and it, it, it gives support to the idea that businesses have broad discretion in deciding what products and services they choose to sell. So this slide has a quote from a 1999 case from the Seventh Circuit called Doe v. Mutual of Omaha. Um, is it an insurance case? But, but here we have the court saying that, quote, the common sense of the statute, the statute being Title III of the ADA, is that the content of the goods and services offered by a place of public accommodation is not regulated. A camera store may not refuse to sell cameras to a disabled person, but it is not required to stock cameras specifically designed for such persons. So put differently, this means that disability rights law at least as construed by this court, does not require businesses to ensure that their offerings provide equal value to all potential users. Which brings me to my next set of the reasons why health tech is currently inaccessible, uh, the economic ones. And so this slide has the image of a keyboard with the words costs and benefits appearing where caps lock and shift keys would be. And the idea here is that businesses weigh the costs and benefits of developing a particular product and service when deciding which technology they want to invest in. And so in the context of digital health technology, the developers that are marketing to providers might just think perhaps correctly, that the current costs outweigh the benefits. So on the benefit side, I mentioned to you all that it's not clear that providers are actively shopping for accessibility. Um, and that means that if the providers are not looking to buy accessible tech, 
making your tech accessible will not necessarily give those developers a competitive edge in the market. Uh, on the cost side, designing accessible health tech is in fact complicated. So we can go back to my example of HIPAA compliance. HIPAA compliance is relatively straightforward. It's, it's a kind of one size fits all solution. The techniques that developers use for securing the data of one user should theoretically work for all the different users. However, the diversity of people with disabilities means that there is no one size fits all solution for accessibility. You have to actually create different solutions to respond to different kinds of barriers. And this gets compounded by the fact that there are, in fact, no clear legally enforceable accessibility standards. So even if a developer wanted to design accessibly, they would have to bear those costs on their own and effectively start from scratch because they have no formal guidance about whether the products and services that they end up creating will be usable by people with disabilities. And it's worth noting that in the context of physical accessibility, there are actually highly detailed federal regulations that are promulgated by an agency called the Access Board, uh, but we don't have something that is comparable to that in the context of digital accessibility. So those are some of the economic reasons. Um, and lastly, there are in fact structural reasons uh, why health tech is inaccessible. Uh, and so this slide features the image of a chasm separating one person in a wheelchair from several people without disabilities. And it's meant to represent the structural barriers that exist. Uh, and these structural barriers come from the reality that providers and developers may just not understand the needs and preferences of patients with disabilities. And that these oversights are more from ignorance and indifference than overt or conscious animus. Uh, so we already have evidence that medical providers don't adequately serve patients with disabilities, even in traditional healthcare settings. So research shows that most physicians are not confident in their ability to provide equitable care for patients with disabilities. And there's also other evidence that they might exhibit bias against people with disabilities. Uh, you add that into the fact that people with disabilities are grossly underrepresented as workers in the medical field. Uh, people with disabilities are also not well represented in the technology sector, and they're often excluded from conversations about which technology to develop and how to develop it. And so the result is both the developers and the providers are not well equipped to design and select technologies that work well for people with disabilities. So we believe that the inaccessibility of health tech is likely the result of a combination of these legal, economic, and structural factors. Yet my co-author and I believe there are also good reasons for prioritizing accessibility in both the design and the adoption of health tech. So this slide has the phrase, why health tech should be accessible. Um, we've emphasized the word should, and it has bullet points for the same categories of reasons, legal, economic, and structural. So legal. This slide has a logo for the Department of Health and Human Services with the, the words uh, ACA, Affordable Care Act, written inside. And so I've chosen to feature the ACA prominently in this slide, but I'm actually going to talk to you all about a variety of different legal protections that apply to healthcare. So several different disability rights laws require providers to offer equitable, accessible, non-discriminatory health care. So in addition to the Affordable Care Act, which I'll, I'll discuss momentarily, uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act covers federally funded entities. Um, so that would extend to a lot of health care providers who might accept um, you know, Medicare dollars um, or grant money or other kinds of, of money from the federal government. Title II of the ADA applies to state and local entities, so that would include things like state-run hospitals. Title III of the ADA, which I've already discussed with you all, that's the one that governs these privately owned entities open to the public, known as public accommodations. The ADA actually, in that list of covered entities, explicitly includes pharmacies, insurance offices, healthcare provider offices, and hospitals as being covered by Title III. And then finally, Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act prohibits health programs or activities that receive federal funds from discriminating on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability. Now, the practical result of these multiple and sometimes overlapping protections is that basically 
every healthcare provider in the United States has a legal obligation to offer accessible, non-discriminatory non healthcare to patients with disabilities. Um, and it's also worth noting that, that HHS, so um, Health and Human Services, which issues the regulations for Section 1557, um, has taken the position that providers covered by that provision must make technologies like web portals um, and personal health tools fully accessible to people with disabilities. And they recently issued a new proposed rule for Section 1557, and it they reiterated that position there. So it is clearly the position of the agency charged with interpreting that provision that Section 1557 also includes these kinds of virtual healthcare tools. So the, what is the point here? The point is that while the law of digital accessibility may not reach developers, we have good reason to think that it could in fact apply to their target market, that is healthcare providers. So healthcare providers have an obligation to make virtual healthcare accessible. And that actually brings me to the economic reasons why we might want to have accessible health tech. So this slide features a drawing of a seesaw with the words cost and benefit on either side. And the seesaw is tipping in favor of the benefit. They're, they're weighing more than the cost. Um, and so what do I mean with this slide? Well, there may in fact be underappreciated benefits for designing health tech accessibly. One of them is that savvy providers who are aware of their legal obligations might be willing to pay a premium for accessible health technology. That means that they might be willing to pay a little bit more for technology that complies with their legal obligations. Um, and the result is that willingness to pay could potentially help offset some of the costs of des designing accessibly. Also, patients with disabilities may have more to gain from accessible health tech than patients without disabilities. So for example, people with disabilities are more likely to have certain kinds of chronic health conditions that can be controlled and monitored using remote patient monitoring. So by targeting those populations, providers and developers could actually get more bang for their buck, so to speak. Um, also too, Designing for people with disabilities might actually result in better health tech for everyone overall. Uh, people with disabilities are a classic edge case. That is, they are not the typical user. And it used to be that in the context of design, that edge cases, designing for the use of edge cases was considered to be inefficient, right? That we just want to make it usable for most people and the people at the margins. Well, you know, we're not going, it, we're not going to worry too much about them. But more recently, developers have begun to understand the value of designing for the margins. And the reality is, is tech that is usable for people with disabilities will probably work better for everyone. And if that's the case, accessible design could actually give developers an edge in the market because they could be producing better products. So those are the economic reasons. And then now I can talk a bit about the structural reasons we think that it is useful to design and implement accessible health tech. So this, this slide has the image of um, blocks or die that spell out the word exclusion. And then there's a hand moving the E and the X to reveal an I and an N. So it's, uh, it's spelling out the word inclusion, right? The idea that we're moving from a world of exclusion to a world of inclusion. Uh, so we think that health tech represents the opportunity for greater inclusion of people with disabilities in both medicine and technology, two spheres where they have been traditionally excluded. Um, and so by creating accessible health tech, we could address inequalities in both areas and that might have spillover effects unrelated to health tech. So we might in fact have you know, more inclusive healthcare generally, we might have more inclusive technology generally, and this could move us towards a more inclusive world. Also, too, uh, there's the possibility that in addressing structural inequality issues for people with disabilities, we also can dismantle inequality for other disadvantaged populations. So people from other disadvantaged populations are more likely to have disabilities. Um, they include older people, people of color, and, and people with low socioeconomic status. And we could then improve the inclusion and equality for those groups. Um, 
So hopefully I have convinced you that health tech should be accessible. But then there's this question, of course, you know, what do we do to facilitate that? Uh, and so this slide says, you know, what do we do? Um, and, and, and it lists the various proposals that uh, my co-author and I have. And we actually suggest a multi-part solution for encouraging the design and adoption of digital health tech. And here it says standards, incentives, mandates, and best practices. So we think it's crucial to set clear digital accessibility standards. I mentioned we currently lack those in the United States. We also think that, that if those standards alone are not enough to inspire accessible design, we could create incentives to design and adopt accessible health tech. So for the, the developers to develop it and for the providers to adopt it. Uh, if the incentives don't work, there's always mandates. Um, of course, there's usually more resistance to mandates. Um, and then as part of this, you know, this, there's the top-down regulation, but really to have meaningful social change, often the, the change needs to come from within. And so we also advocate changing the best practices, both within medicine and within technology to ensure that there is inclusion of people with disabilities. Okay, so here's my first, uh, my first solution slide for standards. Um, we think that establishing clear evidence-based standards is an important first step for any of this, right? This is kind of a prerequisite for all of the other suggestions that flow from it. Um, and this slide has the, the logo for the World Wide Web Consortium's um, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And it also has the logo for the Access Board, that federal agency I mentioned that promulgates accessibility regulations under federal statutes. So as I mentioned, the current lack of guidelines has these uncertainty costs. Even if a developer wants to make tech develop, um, health tech accessible, they might not have a good pathway for doing so. And so if you have guidelines, those guidelines could reduce the costs of accessible design by eliminating at least some of the uncertainty and potentially inspire accessible health tech, even if you don't have a corresponding legal obligation. Um, so of course, the, the question of the need for standards raises the issue of who will write them. You know, there is the World Wide Web Consortium, which is an international web standards organization. They have been issuing accessibility guidelines since 1999. Um, they don't have the force of law in the United States, but they do actually get referenced in some of the regulations. Um, and so, you know, maybe there could be a formal adoption of those standards. Another option would be the, the Access Board, uh, this federal agency. Uh, it currently has guidelines for information and communications technologies that are offered through the federal government, um, but they don't reach private industry. And they do, they, those guidelines actually reference the web content accessibility guidelines, although um, an older version, but it, perhaps the access board could draft its own regulations, right? So those are just two examples of entities that we might look to, to, to create accessibility standards. Uh, if stand, setting standards alone isn't enough, uh, law and policymakers could respond with some incentives for designing and adopting accessible health tech. So this slide features a variety of logos from government incentive programs of different kinds. Um, one of them is from the Minority Business Development Agency with the Department of Commerce, and it says Ready, Set, Grant, right? This is for grants um, for uh, businesses that are, are owned by individuals with certain minority statuses. Um, also, to the Department of Transportation, it created an inclusive design challenge, and there's a, a logo for it. Um, and then on the side, so th that would be incentives that are targeted towards developers. Um, and then I also have a little logo for HIP, HIP, logo for HIPAA and high tech, um, and that would be incentives that would target providers. Um, so a law professor named Chris Buccafusco has talked about accessibility in terms of supply side and demand side incentives, and both are options here. So the supply side incentives are the incentives that target developers, and those are the traditional tools of innovation policies. So patents, grants, prizes, and tax incentives. You know, this slide includes a couple examples of incentive programs for accessible design. On the demand side, the incentives would target providers. A good example is the High Tech Act uh, that I mentioned inspired greater HIPAA compliance. 
Um, and the High Tech Act uses carrots and sticks. So it offered covered providers payments, um, little in incentive payments, or actually I shouldn't say little, quite generous, um, in fact, incentive payments um, that scaled down for adopting electronic medical records. Um, it also increased penalties for HIPAA violations um, and increased some of the funding for enforcement of HIPAA. And so, you know, we could do something similar related to accessibility that isn't just mandating accessibility, telling, you know, healthcare providers, okay, you're going to need to comply with these, these obligations that already exist. So that is the potential incentives can move on to mandates. Um, so, you know, I, I mentioned that mandates tend to meet more resistance, uh, but this slide here has images of section 1557 um, and insignia indicating ADA compliance um, and a little text description of a proposed bill, HR 4853, which was the Medical Device Non-Visual Accessibility Act, which got proposed in summer 2021. So as I already explained, healthcare providers already have at least some obligations to practice medicine equitably and accessibly, um, but healthcare providers cannot adopt technology that doesn't exist. So that means that we need to encourage developers to develop accessible health technology. Uh, and we could do so through some mandates. Um, now, legislators have a couple options for intervention. One might be extending disability rights legislation to these particular entities, right? So HIPAA includes business associates. And so we could say, okay, section 1557 is not only the providers, but also perhaps their business associates. Um, and, in our paper, we recommend extending Section 1557 opposed to Title III of the, the ADA, um, in part because Title III has relatively weak enforcement mechanisms. Uh, and again, that's something I'm happy to, to talk about in the Q&A, why we think Section 1557 would be the best way to extend the current law if that's what lawmakers want to do. Uh, lawmakers could also just adopt new legislation from scratch. Uh, and there is the example of this proposed bill, the Medical Device Non-Visual Accessibility Act. And what that law would have done uh, is it would have required certain kinds of medical devices that have digital interfaces, so those kinds of patient monitoring technologies, to be accessible to users with visual impairments. Um, and the companies that produce moderate to high risk devices would have to comply with standards. And if that law was passed, it would have said it would have charged the access board and the FDA with drafting those standards. So, so those are all of the kinds of actions that law and policymakers can potentially make. Um, but we also believe that we have to change the cultures of medicine and technology. So this slide says best practices, uh, and it has an image of a caduceus, as well as a cluster of different kinds of technologies like smartphones, tablets, and laptops. So what needs to change in the culture of medicine? Well, we think that medical education could incorporate curriculum teaching disability cultural competence, that is teaching uh, med students and other healthcare professionals how to better serve patients with disabilities. It could also teach them about these legal obligations that I told you all they have, but they may not fully appreciate. Um, also too, you'd want to include these topics in continuing medical education to make sure that we're getting not just the next generation of providers, but people who are currently practicing. Uh, we could also actively recruit individuals with disabilities to enter medical professions to, to help address that underrepresentation problem. Um, and then probably for this to all actually work meaningfully, we might need to devote resources to ensuring that the health tech when adopted is being implemented properly, which might include education of the providers as well as potentially patients. Um, and in technology, you know, we advocate similar kinds of things, right? That, that individuals that develop technology should partner with people with disabilities at all points in the design process. So not just sort of at the tail end to try to, you know, create some sort of accessibility overlay, right? But, but really from conception, what kinds of technologies 
would be useful for people with disabilities and then getting feedback with them throughout the process. Um, and also to recruiting people with disabilities to technology focused academic programs to encourage them to enter the, the industry. Um, you know, people without disabilities tend not to, um, to we, we, people without disabilities tend to not be very good at imagining what it might be like to have a particular disability. So if we have developers with disabilities actively creating the technology, that means that there's a greater likelihood of ending up with accessible health tech. Um, so those are our suggestions about how to affect change. Um, I'll end with some concluding thoughts. So this slide has a drawing of a person in a wheelchair at the foot of the stairs of a medical building. Um, and it also has another image with the symbol of a person in a wheelchair separated by a crack from a computer, which is intended to signify the digital divide. Uh, and so I want to end by telling you all that fixing accessibility in health tech uh, is not a panacea. We're still going to have challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, first, people with disabilities will still need access to traditional analog healthcare. So we can't abandon our efforts to make sure that facilities and medical equipment are usable by patients regardless of disability, right? Not all healthcare can go online. Um, and, and if we have too much reliance on technology, that might actually create disincentives for ensuring accessible in-person care. So you might imagine that a clinic relying on virtual appointments might be slow to fix a broken elevator or might reduce the hours of their on-site sign language interpreter. And that would be an unfortunate outcome. We need to make sure that in-person care continues to be accessible. Also too, it is worth noting that people with disabilities also experience barriers with respect to technology apart from the accessibility of websites and apps. So people with disabilities are less likely to own technology or go online than people without disabilities. Uh, in fact, some research shows that Americans with disabilities are three times as likely to never go online. Um, and so we would need to address these issues as well. There was some legislation that was called the Proposed Access Technology Affordability Act, which would have given tax credits for hardware and software designed to be used by people with visual impairments. Um, also too, we could ensure that um, it, access to devices in the context of health tech might be covered by insurance. Um, the FCC also has a task force devoted to ensuring equitable broadband in the context of health. So we could have interventions like those. So in light of these limitations, you know, why did I spend almost an hour telling you all that I think it's important we make health tech accessible? I will just leave you with this. Uh, I really do believe that it, it presents a unique opportunity for innovation and intervention. Uh, well, you know, when the ADA passed, the physical environment was already inaccessible, right? But digital technology is recently is a, is a recent development. Um, and now we're, we're seeing widespread adoption in healthcare over the course of the pandemic. Uh, and so we can hopefully reverse course and act quickly to ensure that we are building accessible, inclusive health tech. And that will in fact save us money in the long run. It's always less expensive to design accessibly from the beginning instead of to retrofit. This is true for the physical and digital environments. Um, and also too, there'll be transaction costs if we have to make healthcare providers switch the tech that they're using. Um, and of course, there's important potential spillover effects in other areas that we might just have a, a more inclusive world. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you so much for your, um, for your time. This slide says, thank you for your time. And it has all my titles um, and my contact information that I said I would give to you all if you wanna reach out to me. So my email address is jrobert, there's no S, R-O-B-E-R-T-6 at central.uh.edu. And you can find me on Twitter at jrobertsuhlc. And that is all I have. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, this is Max Melman, co-director of the Law Medicine Center here at Case Western Reserve University.
sorry I joined late and was not able to introduce you, but thank you for a tremendously uh, compelling talk. We have uh, a little bit of time for uh, questions. Uh, I have received some questions from members of the audience. Uh, so the first question is, does Section 504 cover websites and therefore fill some of the gap left by the circuit split regarding Title III? So there is some, there is some, there are some regulations that interpret 504 as ex extending online. Also to Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act um, has been interpreted to apply to, to digital technologies. Um, but there is the concern, at least from our perspective, that this application hasn't been consistent. Um, and in fact, um, you know, for whatever reason, courts have not been inclined to, to follow the regulations. So even though you have agencies interpreting disability rights legislation, like it should apply online, and there are examples of cases applying them, um, you know, to, uh, to other, well, that there, there are examples of, of applications of Section 504 online. Um, also, there are examples of applications of Title II online. The issue, I think, in the context of this technology that we're talking about is that the developers of this tech are not, in fact, taking the federal funding themselves. So the kind of hook that would make Section 504 and Section 508 applicable wouldn't necessarily apply to these entities. Um, yeah, because for, for a second I was like, why doesn't that fix the problem? And the answer is because these entities often are not government are not government agencies and um, are not taking the funding themselves. Um, they are these these are they are these businesses that are selling technology to providers. Um, so that that is my answer, but I had to think about it for a second. Um, but it is that these particular companies, I don't think would get reached by um, even the favorable regulations and decisions for online accessibility. Thank you very much. Okay, another question. Um, the uh, ADA includes uh, an undue burden defense. Uh, so uh, are there circumstances in which designers uh, or providers could successfully argue that making health tech accessible poses an undue burden? Yeah, I, I think, um, so currently I, I don't know that Title III would actually extend to them. If Title III did, um, I, you, this is something that I've thought about in terms of which portions of Title III do, should we, for the physical environment, should we use as an analog in the, the digital environment? Um, and I have advocated, or at least I advocate in this paper, not relying on the sort of the, the primary Title III protection, but rather the accessibility provisions that Title III includes. So Title III, you know, to have a lawsuit, usually, you know, you would have to have an individual with a disability who then does not get full and equal enjoyment of, um, you know, whatever the good or service is. And so, you know, the only entities that you can that you can sue, right, are the ones that, you know, encounter an individual with disability. Um, but Title III also includes these accessibility guidelines that apply to all covered entities, regardless of, you know, whether or not they ever encounter an individual with a disability. And so in the paper, um, opposed to the, the undue burden defense, the, the cost reducing mechanism that we advocate is actually what's known colloquially as the old new distinction, which is uh, anything created after the, um, the effective date of the statute has to be fully compliant. Anything created before does not have to comply um, unless, uh, unless it's you know, very easy, unless it's readily achievable to comply. Um, and insofar as you make an update, the update has to be done excessively. Um, and so I think that that, that, is, that opposed to the undue burden 
that is what I, I, I have in the paper as a, a cost conserving mechanism, right? The idea that we're not gonna impose retrofitting costs. Um, and really, you know, it's the, it says, you know, when you're talking about the updates, it's that you make the updates accessible and the language is something like to the maximum extent feasible. Um, so that is another way in which we wouldn't impose costs that are too great. Um, but yeah, I've, I've thought a lot about sort of what the appropriate analog under Title III would be. And I, and I like the accessibility standards, um, but you know, the possibility of you know, an undue burden defense might also make sense, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, a question uh, concerns uh, the uh, uh, relationship of your discussion to the Veterans Administration. Okay. Um, do you have any uh, uh, particular uh, uh, thoughts about this issue uh, as confronted by the Veterans Administration uh, and their accessibility problems for their, uh, uh, for their clients? So I think that, so, so that is an entity that might, that, that I think would, is, is outside the scope of this particular paper, right? Um, because I suspect that, um, that the VA would be creating its own tech and websites opposed to getting its technology from these third party kinds of vendors. Um, but I think that the analysis that we have here in terms of the fact that there's an obligation to provide equitable health care. And I, I, mean, I would think that section 1557 would clearly apply. And if you, you know, if you take the, if, if you believe the HH, HHS's interpretation, that means that any online healthcare services offered by the VA should also be, um, should also be accessible. Um, I don't know if that answers the person's question, hopefully, but that, that to me sounds like an example that is more clear cut than the kinds of ones that I was using where, yeah, there's just an obligation to be accessible. And insofar as it's not accessible, there's a, a violation of existing federal statutes, I would think. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, a, a number of years ago, we had a conference uh, here at the law school. I don't know if you attended on... Um, medical, uh, electronic medical records issues. And uh, one of the things we learned at that conference uh, was that a lot of the problems, or at least some of the problems that providers face uh, when they're dealing with electronic medical records, and I think the problem for uh, 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 people with disabilities uh, and, and indeed patients in general uh, is only you know, exacerbated by the problem, is that uh, the, the technologies uh, are not properly beta tested. Um, so, for example, electronic medical records are beta tested maybe with physicians who have to use them, but those physicians are very computer savvy. They don't represent, you know, the, the, the full range of, of, of technological, you know, savviness. Um, do you have any, uh, so uh, do you think that there should be some standards for requiring uh, these technologies to be beta tested by the actual people who need to uh, you know, be able to use them? That's a great idea. Uh, you know, I, I think if we set accessibility standards, which I really so so that I am, I do not think I was at that conference, but I am not surprised to to learn that. Um, and I think that if we set clear web accessibility standards, that would address some of these issues. Where hopefully the standard, so, so we could do beta testing figure out what kinds of interventions and technologies work for patients with disabilities and then make those the standards so we don't have to, to beta test things subsequently, right? So hopefully, you know, some initial testing and integration of people with disabilities would then create um, accessible technologies. And one of the things that uh, we mentioned in the paper is that you can sort of think of this as a first actor problem, right? That somebody has to do it first and somebody has to incur the cost of doing it. And then, you know, once you figure out how to make a, you know, fully accessible patient portal, well, then other entities can kind of fall suit, fall, follow suit, but, you know, we need someone to take that initial leap and, and, and design that technology. So I think beta testing would be a potential solution, but it's my hope that 
if we can if we can solve these problems and generate some good reliable standards we can just enforce those standards um, and one thing that's worth noting about the proposed um, section 1557 rule is that um, it it asks people to comment on whether or not there should be set standards, um, you know, whether or not you should use the web content accessibility guidelines or maybe something else. Um, and, and if there are set standards, whether or not there should be a safe harbor for, um, you know, it, for following those standards. And so, you know, that would mean, and, and this is kind of how those physical accessibility guidelines that I mentioned work, right? If, if you follow the access board guidelines, that that protects you from liability, even if an individual person, for whatever reason, has difficulty with with access. Um, and so you would have a similar thing for the health tech, right? Where if we had set guidelines and the provider could say, "Look, I used these Section 1557 certified technologies," um, you know, that person wouldn't that um, that provider wouldn't be liable. Um, and then you could say, you know, perhaps if you wanted to extend liability to the developers, the developers wouldn't be liable either. Um, so I think that uh, I think that standards is just the figuring out how to do it and then telling people is the is the essential first step to any of this. That's a long winded answer, Max. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you're muted, I think. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much. We are uh, at the end.